Welcome to the 2020 United States Power Squadron's Governing Board Workshop on OpenCPN. We don't usually know much about the people who write the software we use. OpenCPN is a monumental effort, and you have to wonder who these people are, especially when you consider they don't get paid. Like us, they are volunteers. OpenCPN lists 20 current and 33 past developers on their website. Dave Register is the lead developer and founder. He initially built OpenCPN for his own use, not liking the commercial navigation software available at the time. And he would know. Since the year 2000, Dave has lived full-time on a Passage Maker 48, a catamaran trawler. Uh, that's two hulls and no sails. In the past 20 years, he's been all over, but loves cruising around Canada. I think I may have seen his boat, or one like it, a few years ago in Pulpit Harbor in Maine, but I'll never know for sure. OpenCPN is a free, open-source marine charting and navigation program. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Unix PCs, and Android mobile devices. We use it as a teaching tool in a number of our courses. It's heavily used in marine navigation and offshore navigation, and also has advanced tide and current prediction features, and even will display current and predicted weather information. First, we'll start with the basics, downloading and installing the application, loading charts, and some basic functionality. Next, we'll take a look at how OpenCPN is used to address topics in the Marine Navigation course, which is still in development. We all know the best way to learn is to have a problem to solve. So in this section, we'll do just that, solve some problems. Next, we'll talk about connecting devices to machines running OpenCPN. The most obvious is a GPS receiver, so we can see our position on the OpenCPN chart. But there are other useful connections, like AIS. Lastly, we'll talk about teaching with OpenCPN. Many of us are the teachers, or the ones who teach the teachers, in our squadrons and districts. Understanding how we teach with OpenCPN will make it easier to spread the knowledge throughout the organization. The sessions today are produced and conducted by Andy Sumberg, John Farmer, and Michael Mazinski. Andy is a past rear commander of Educational Outreach Committee and OpenCPN user and has conducted OpenCPN workshops in the past. He has taught J and N N for the past 10 years owns a 35-foot sailboat, and would rather be on the water on any nice day. John is a retired inland commercial passenger vessel captain. He installed and set up their navigation electronics, including OpenCPM. He has over 40 years of boating experience, both recreational and commercial, including piloting passenger vessels on the Alabama, Chattahoochee, Mississippi, and Tennessee rivers. He is a district education officer, and serves on the USPS Navigation Committee developing new courses in marine navigation and advanced marine navigation. Michael is a lifelong boater, both power and sail. His current boat is a 40-foot catamaran. He has been an educator for 20 years and a network engineer for 10. Mike has considerable blue water experience, having sailed from Annapolis to the Bahamas nine times. He has taught aspects of open CPN a number of times in many USPS courses and seminars. Michael is Education Officer for Annapolis Sail and Power Squadron since 2008. It's probably too early to have a break, so why don't we just get started? Today we're going to go over installing OpenCPN from scratch onto your local drive, and we'll be using a Windows PC today. Uh, the installation is very similar on a Macintosh. The first thing you need to do is go up to opencpm.org and download the current installer. When you do that, it'll put it usually in your downloads directory, and you will see I have a setup file called OpenCPN 5.0 Setup EXE. Once that has been downloaded, all you need to do is open up your downloads folder 
and double click on OpenCPN setup and the program will begin its install cycle. The first thing it's going to ask is what language you wish to install it in and it is capable of being installed with a lot of different languages. All right, I'm going to select English and say OK. The OpenCPM window comes up and it's going to be menu driven so there's very little you need to do except, except the defaults. In this case there's a license We'll just select next. And it's going to tell you it's going to add a shortcut to the start menu and create a start, start icon on your desktop. And it'll open this CPM configure settings or create them. The next thing it's going to do is ask you where it wants to put it. On most computers, you will put it in the default location, which is the C drive program files for 8086 computers in a folder called OpenCPN. If you have a Windows machine with multiple hard drives and you wish to install it on a secondary drive, this is where you would indicate that. At this point, we're just going to take the default, which is the C drive, and we're going to say next. It's going to create a start menu item called OpenCPN, and that's fine. We're going to say next. and if I had a pre-existing chart directory, I could point it to there now and it would automatically configure it. But since installing charts is one of the next things we're going to talk about, it's not being pointed anywhere. So we're just going to go next. And at this point, it summarizes what we just did. And I say install. And I said finish. All right, and it'll open up, and you'll see right away the base map for OpenCPN. If I scroll in on my mouse, the image will zoom out. If I scroll forward, it'll zoom in. The first place that you will see the boat is right here in the United States. One of the developers lives in Georgetown, South Carolina. And that's where the home setting currently is set to. And basically, the program's up and running. Right now, there are no charts. But you can see there are some things that are important to see here. Um, there are two places for tools. All right? This is your main toolbar. And if you pause your cursor over any one of them, it tells you what the tool is. Uh, for example, this hides and expands the menu, settings options, this create routes, uh, the route and mark manager, uh, enable tracking, change the color scheme for nighttime use. You can send the chart to the printer. There are directions and help screens and the magnetic um, files that are being used. And the thing that looks like a life preserver is man overboard. You have a scale here. And if you look across the bottom of the screen, you'll see lot and latitudes are being displayed. And you can also increase or decrease the size of the picture here. This particular item here will put the screen centered wherever the boat is and start tracking. And this little item here which resembles the one up at the upper left also expands a menu of options for the charts and the programs. We will take the next part, download our first set of charts. Welcome to OpenCPM installing charts. Today we're going to talk about installing charts on your OpenCPM. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to start OpenCPN and I'm going to run it in a window so that I have some screen space so that you can see what's going on on the screen. All right, the first thing that happens when you do OpenCPN is that you end up with just one chart in the program. It's called a base chart. And what we need is to add charts. You have Probably your cruising area is Maryland, and you would like to have the charts for Maryland. 
And we also have a set of training charts, one for Bottage Bay and one for the Martha's Vineyard area. Uh, you both mostly will be using the Bottage Bay charts. Um, all right, so let's see how we go about getting charts. Boy, this is probably one of the more confusing parts of OpenCPM. Let's start with this menu on the upper left-hand side of the screen, and we're going to start with the Options menu. When I open that up, that is your basic toolbar that lets you configure all the menus within OpenCPM. There's a menu set for charts, and it's looking for directories where your charts are stored. Um, you have several kinds of charts that this will use, vector charts, as well as what they call raster charts. And I'm going to talk about their difference in just a few minutes. You can make groups of charts. There is a tide and currents table that is downloaded. And this is something that you will be able to update periodically uh, as you deal with OpenCM, CPM. And there's something called a chart downloader page. And this is where we actually will be going to to get most of our uh, charts. But to start with, there's, I want to go back to these menus across the top. And there's something here called plugins. Plugins are all the little add-on programs that add functionality to the core program of OpenCPM. And the one we're interested in at this moment here is called the chart downloader. And I'm going to open that up by clicking on it. And the first thing I want to do is it's enabled right now because the option here to disable is, is available. If it was disabled, then enable would be available. But I want to look at the preferences because this is an important thing that you need to know. This particular preference defines the path to where OpenCPM is going to put charts. I'm going to suggest that you use the default location. Don't change it all right, and leave it like it is. But there are a couple options on the screen that I do want you to check. Right now it says all updated charts after catalog selections are selected for downloads, it's going to update all the charts. I also want you to check all new charts and allow for bulk updating. All right, since this is on a PC and you may download a whole, whole lot of charts, when you're ready to go back to NOAA, which is where we're going to get our charts, and update them, um, you might as well let it update all of them. Uh, if I'm sitting in a marina and I have limited Wi-Fi capabilities, I'll come in here and turn that off, and I will select the charts that I wanted to check for updates. Therefore, I don't spend a lot of time on the Internet. But when you're at home, you can just fire off an update and kind of walk away from it. So this is a really good thing to have. And when you're done with any menu, you always want to say apply or okay, depending on which options options are available. You would do apply first if it was there and okay after the process had finished. Now I have my chart downloader configured. And as you look down here, you'll see that there's an apply button. So I'm going to say apply. And there's okay. All right, okay will exit the screen. So I'm not done with setting things up. So at this moment, apply was what I needed to do. And now I'm going to go to charts. Charts, this is the menu that lets us configure all the chart information. And right now, I want to use the last tab in this window, which is called chart downloader. This is where I will request charts from NOAA. And these are the charts you want to get. You'll notice there's some items here where you can select things. I'm going to say add. And when I say add, a set of predefined locations for charts are there. And the first thing I want to get is the graphical high resolution base map so that I always get updates on any base maps that are changed. And if you'll notice down the left hand side of there, are pluses and when you click on the plus it opens up and I want to have all the high resolution base maps. When I click on that, 
down in the chart directory, you'll see that it's going to put it in my user folder inside of documents, inside a folder called charts, and it's going to make a directory just for those high res charts. I don't need to select a folder unless I want to put these someplace else. But this is the default location, and that is indeed where I want them. So I'm going to say OK. Now I probably want some other charts. I'm going to go back to my add button. Charts that you can get, the USA NOAA inland charts are all under this tab right here that says USA NOAA. Uh, there's a chart catalog that contains charts from a lot of different countries in the world. And you can get charts from other sources other than here too. There's US pilot charts. Pilot charts are used for passage planning in the oceans. And they are basically charts of weather and wave information for each month of the year. And they contain a lot of information for people who are planning passages. Uh, you probably won't need those. The MBT tiles, these are NOAA things of pictures of raster chart areas. So you can get a photograph also displayed. We're not going to deal with that right here and in this section. I just want to download a map. Now, there are two kinds of charts, as you can see here. One called RNC standing for raster navigation chart and ENC which stands for electronic navigation chart you want to download the area of maps that you want or charts rather uh, both in raster and in electronic because you need to start you need to learn how both of them are used and you need to um, see different information in each one uh, the Charts you will mostly use for the piloting course are raster. Now, what raster charts are, they are just literally photographs of the paper chart. Now, and what that means is the, the paper chart has one representation. All the detail is there. No matter how you zoom in on it or away from it, the same data appears. An electronic chart is basically just that it's a mathematical representation of a chart and therefore the computer actually draws the chart from that mathematical information and you can change things then you can change uh, water depth coloring you can change what is displayed and depending on your zoom and what you've asked to display the charts will display different information at different zooms so that's where most new charting is going to and that's also what all the large ships use for navigation so let's start with downloading some raster charts i'm going to click on the r and c button and here's all the way you can download raster charts you can ask for all of them i firmly don't suggest you do this you can ask for charts by coast guard district all right that's one way to do it. Another is by Coast Guard region. All right, I like that because that includes a lot of areas. But for those of us right now, for everybody in this class, let's do by state. Most of us will probably want Maryland charts. All right, and if you scroll down, you'll see that there's one for Maryland. If you scroll, if you do sail down the lower part of the bay, you probably want to have Virginia also. So let's start with Maryland. And I clicked on that. And you can see here where it says chart directly directory. It says my home directory documents. And it's also going to put it in charts in an RCN RNC folder and for Maryland. So I don't need to change the selection of that because that's the default. That's what I want. So I'm going to say OK. Now I've selected the RNC charts for Maryland. If I would wish to add Virginia, I can come in and do USA NOAA inland charts again, RC by state. And I can scroll down to Virginia and also add those. Now, I do recommend that we do the same for the ENC charts. So I'm going to add. And this time, instead of selecting RNC, I'm going to select ENC by state. And again, 
slowed, strolled down to Maryland. And this time it's going to put those in a folder called ENCs. And I'm going to say OK. And one more time, I'm going to go to add US NOAA charts, ENCs, in this by state. And I want to grab the Virginia ENC maps chart. I'm sorry, the yard charts also and say OK. Now, these are the charts that we get from NOAA. You say, well, what about the training charts? The training charts we're just going to drag and drop. You do not have to let download charts from NOAA. You can download things manually and just put them in your charts folder. And you, OpenCPN will find them because you're going to tell it where they are. But for right now, I have these charts. And I like to get them. So what I'm going to say is update them all. And it's going to say I've chosen to update all the chart catalogs and download all the new charts. This may take a long time if you've selected a lot of charts. That took about 10 minutes. And I downloaded all my charts. All right, just a little note. At any time you want, if you want to go check and see if there are new versions of any of these charts, all you need to do is open up the settings tool, go to, to charts menus, chart downloader, and just say update all. Or you can click on any one and just say update that. They're easy to download. NOAA keeps the charts current and makes it real easy for us to go out there and get uh, the charts we need to navigate with. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to where it says chart files. And you can see that it's automatically kind of populated your charts folder automatically with the base charts, the RNC charts, and the ENC charts. Now you can say, well, how do I add the charts for the training charts? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy it, the whole folder. And now I'm going to, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to close that. Go back to my documents folder, go in my charts folder, and I'm going to paste it. And now I got the Bottage Bay raster chart in there. All right. Now, on, if when I go back to OpenCPN and close that, however, notice the Bottage Bay chart did not appear in my charts, chart files directory. I need to add that. So right here is a little handy little button that says Add Directory. And right now, I can, it brings me to a standard dialog box for files. And it's inside my PC documents charts ENC. Well, that's not where that directory is. It's up a level. So I'm going to go up a level. And there it is. So I click on it. And I say select the folder. And now Bottage Bay raster chart has been added to the charts. All right. And you can add any set of charts that you want in that fashion also, if you get them from a secondary source other than NOAA. All right, just another couple things while we're sitting here. Um, I'll go into chart configurations later, but there's something here called chart groups. And right now, the only thing listed there is all charts. And I'll talk a little bit more about those at a later time. But there is a way you say, I want to have just Maryland or just Virginia, and we can create groups that do that. Right now, it needs to know where these charts are. So what I'm going to do is I want to say, all right, it needs to build a database. I'm going to say, force a full database rebuild. And I'm going to say, apply. And at this moment, OpenCPM now is going to scan all the charts and build a database of all those charts. And if you'll notice in the background behind this tool, the minute it finished building that database, a real chart appeared. And we can, at this moment, say there's OK, 
There are a couple other things like prepare all ENC charts, and I'll talk more about that in the next lesson. So right now I'm gonna say okay. And all of a sudden, as I zoom out, you will see that we are sitting in the Chesapeake Bay, and this is the bay charts of the Chesapeake Bay. Right now I'm gonna move my boat right here just to make things a little scroll. You can see there's a picture of a boat, and I can move that around. If I attach this to a GPS, then wherever the GPS says my boat is, that's where it's gonna display it on the chart. So right now you can see this is Kent Island on this side, and this is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and these are the chart, this is a set of charts for the area. At the bottom of our screen, these rectangles represent all the charts that OpenCPM is seeing for this area. And this particular chart, the one on the far left-hand side, is an RNC chart. At the very top, you see user Michael Mazensky, Michael Documents Charts RNC. The next chart over is an ENC chart. It's in green. If I click on that button, all of a sudden now the chart changes nature, and I'm now looking at what's called an ENC chart. Not much detail is showing yet because I haven't told OpenCPN exactly what it is I want to see. Now you may ask, where is Bonnage Bay? If I zoom out, and I zoom out so you can see New England up here, that's where Bonnage Bay is. All right, let's see if I click on the chart. There it is. I had to click on the chart display. All right, and there's Bonnage Bay. And you can see that it's up there by Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, it's kind of stuck in the middle of land. Uh, somebody asked a question the other day when they were plotting charts on their uh, plotter, noticed that anything they plotted for Bonnage Bay is in the middle of the land. And I, yes, it is. But this is our fictional trading chart that we can use. Because the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to talk about all the toolbars and settings and how you go about making OpenCPN uh, display what you want it to see. I hope this lets you get started and get your first set of charts installed. Continuing with the presentations on OpenCPN. And today we're going to talk about menu settings, uh, what they do, and suggestions for your default starting settings for um, using OpenCPN. First, I want to show you the OpenCPN website. Everything we go over today, just so that you know, uh, OpenCPM has a very good website. It's uh, well done, it's maintained well, uh, it's at opencpm.org, and when you get there, you will see um, some tutorials. What I want to point out right now is the manuals page. If I go to the manuals page, you'll see that there are several ways that you can get those menus. They are online, so you can use them live from your browser. You can also download them, which is really neat, and put them on your device. And if you ever get stuck, you have a manual that you can go to and find the answer right on your machine. You have a lot of resources, and I can't say enough about this resource. It's really good when you need to go back and refresh your memory on how something works, this is the perfect place to go. All right, first off, let's take a good look at the OpenCPM screen. And it's got a whole bunch of things around the screen that show you different information pieces. All right, let's see what these menus are also. If you look at this menu, if I put my cursor and hover over it, you'll see that a little explanation bar pops out. And this one is the hide toolbar. So if I click on it, you'll see the toolbar collapses. And if I hit it again, the toolbar opens up. And each one of these are a different tool. Like these are options. This one's creative route. This one is the route and tool route and mark manager. This one turns off and on tracking. This one changes the color scheme of the screen. 
you can print a chart if you have whatever's on your screen. If you send it to the printer, you'll print what you're seeing. And this uh, engages your browser, goes to the manuals page of OpenCPM. This talks about the uh, magnetic variation. If you need to see the magnetic variation for your area, uh, it shows it. And this is a man overboard. And if you add other plugins like GRIB and weather routing and so forth, they will show up in this bar also. If I go up down the screen, the first thing you see are a bunch of uh, blue and green bars line. These are all the different charts that OpenCPM sees for where your window is right now in the world. If I go to the green one here, you'll see that it's an ENC in an ENC folder. So anything with a green icon is a, a vector or electronic chart. If you look at the next tool over, you see that there's a plus and a minus. Of course, that zooms in and out. That's the scale of the chart. As you zoom in, you'll see that changes. That's a particular scale of the chart you're looking at. This particular icon of the ship, if I click on it, it centers the chart wherever my boat is. And it also turns on tracking of the boat. Sometimes when you click and move your cursor around the screen, your boat will move off the screen or you'll move the chart someplace else. Instead of moving around and trying to find your boat again, you just click on the boat and it'll bring the boat back into view. The menu bar item, this last piece here, opens a pop-up menu. On What they did in five was to move some menu things that people frequently changed while navigating. One item was north up and course up. If I click course up, I want you to look up here at this icon up here because this little circle would have uh, ship icon in it shows whether you're looking at north up or course up. And right now, if it's blue and pointing up, that's north up. If I click on the course up, you'll see it turns red. And right now, I happen to have a course that's pointing up. But if I was actually moving east or west, my arrow would move pointing in the direction that the uh, um, chart was looking. All right. Show chart outlines. Right now, the chart outlines are shown. You can see all the green charts for all the different little things I got. I can turn that off. So if I check that off, you can see right away all the charts have this chart outlines have disappeared. Tides and currents. You can show tide stations. If I turn on that, all the tide stations showing the tide at this time of day are showing. If I move my cursor over and right click on one of those, the full tide chart will come up showing me the state of the tide and where it's going. Uh, show currents. The current charts will show. If I zoom in a little bit here, you'll see one of the current vectors. All right, here's a current station. And it's showing me that current moves in this, is moving in this direction at the time of day. If I right click on it, again, a full current chart will come out. Good. And if I no longer need this pop up chart, clicking here makes it go away. Now, across the bottom of the screen, um, you will see that you have speed over ground. So once you have your GPS is running, uh, the speed over ground will be computed and displayed here, and your course over ground will be displayed here. Next, your latitude will be displayed, uh, the current course heading, and the n distance from cursors from your boat. So this is actually measuring from my boat to where the cursor is. Also, if you right-click your mouse, this alternate menu will pop up, and it's measure, uh, object query, drop a mark, new mark, move the boat here, navigate to here, center to view, course up mode, toggle full screen mode, and AIS target list. So what I mean by object query, for example, if I come up here, right click and I say object query, another chart is gonna pop up that's gonna tell me uh, a little bit more detail about that particular um, chart object. All right, let's look at the settings and go into the menus. When you open up your settings tool, 
a couple of things that are important to note. First on display, things that I like to go over and, and set when I first install OpenCPM are as I, I changed a lot of this. Units. Units are uh, how the chart, particularly vector charts, are displaying information. In this particular case, distances are always going to be displayed as nautical miles. I can use statute miles, kilometers, and meters. Speed can be displayed in knots, miles per hour, kilometers per hour, and meters per, per second. Depth can be displayed as feet, meters, or fathoms. Bearings. I can show the true, true chart bearing, or I can show the magnetic bearing, which would be my compass. And backing up the lat long. You can display lat long as degrees in a decimal de minutes, like we do in most of our classes. Decimal degrees, which you see in a lot of roadmap programs, are degrees, minutes, and seconds. I generally keep it the degrees and decimal minutes because we've already talked about the charts tool. Let's look at the connection tool. This is very uh, important when you want to add a GPS. We'll discuss this in detail later today. Ship tab. There are a number of parameters you can change about your boat and how it and information about it is displayed. In the interest of time, we will skip this topic today. Routes and points. You can tell it what a waypoint looks like. There's a ton of different icons that you can use for waypoints and different things on your screen. This is, they're all marks. All right, you can designate any one of them. And here's a good one to know. Um, lock waypoints, unless waypoint is, has a proper dialogue visible. What they're asking you here is, after you've created routes and you've set some waypoints, lock them. That way, if you're scrolling your chart, all right, and you accidentally put your mouse on one and scroll, you'll move a waypoint instead. So this will let you uh, keep the waypoints from jumping around unless you deliberately click on it. It gets a yellow um, square around it, meaning it's been selected. Then you can move it or change its property. And of course, when you go to delete a waypoint or a route, make sure it give, asks you, do you really want to do this? Last toolbar that we're going to look at in this presentation is the user interface. User interface is how you see OpenCPN. Interface options, I can show the status bar. You can have it show the menu bar also. Um, and sometimes I turn that on. All right, you can show compass and GPS status window, which is already shown, which is this little window up here. All right, you can enable a toolbars to hide. If you're using it on a touchscreen device like a tablet, you can enable a touchscreen interface. And again, when you're in a menu, you always say apply when you're done, if you've changed anything. And then you say OK. And that closes your setting windows. And OpenCPM is now uh, configured the way you wanted it. Um, I do recommend that you take time and play with a lot of these. Read about what they do and change them and make them suit how you like looking at the chart. And then you have OpenCPM configured to your preferences and um, it'll be your friend. I hope everybody got some information out of this that they didn't know and that they're ready to um, continue uh, using OpenCPM. Okay, for those of you who uh, missed the introduction, that was Mike Mazinski. Um, what I'd like to do is take questions for Mike. If you have a question, unmute yourself and please wait to be called upon. I will call on you. Uh, Mike, one thing, it would be great if you could uh, reiterate for us the platforms that OpenCPN will run on. Yeah, OpenCPN is very versatile. It runs on um, Windows machines of all kinds. And even some of the worst junk you might have in your inventory can uh, have a uh, GPS put on it and OpenCPN will run on it and it'll work. Macintosh computers of all kinds, again in age, um, so it's a really good thing to do with an old machine. Android phones and tablets of all sorts and Linux devices like, like the re Raspberry Pis or any Linux, Linux device you have. The real nice thing about this is uh, 
with electronic devices, it gives you the ability to provide a lot of redundancy on your boat. I have my phone with OpenCPN on it and all the charts that I need. I'll have a laptop or two or maybe a tablet and we may have a computer running besides our uh, Raymarine uh, chart plotter. So if anything goes down, there's a replacement somewhere for it. Thanks, Mike. So it looks like uh, Ted Reese has a question. Ted? My question is where can I get the Bowditch chart and the training chart so that I can add that to my computer? All right, you had there's some documents, but you had it from someplace. Yes, the two places you get it is uh, your uh, SEO can get it from the educational website for United States Power mm -hmm. Squadrons, and it's there as part of the downloads for all the navigation courses. If you go into your favorite search engine and also search for uh, Bottage Bay um, and the 1210. Uh, training chart, you will see that there's also other places that have it. So um, the easiest to get it is uh, United States Power Squadron. The other places, it's there too. And once you download it and unzip it and put it in a folder, you just drop that into your charts folder, tell OpenCPN it's there, and away you go. Thank you. Uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, Cliff, you got a question? Yes, I'm wondering if it can be uploaded to your Raymarine chart plotters on your boat rather than just operate on a computer. As far as I know, no, because Raymarine and all chart plotters like Garmin and all that have a proprietary operating system, unless you've managed to uh, neutralize that and installed something like Linux on it. Uh, but I'm uh, totally unfamiliar with that. Uh, but what can happen is, and which I recommend use by a lot of people, it's OpenCPN runs really nice at home on your home machine, and use that for your trip planning, and all the chart plotters will let you share a GPX file. Um, and you put that on a SD card or something and just move them right back and forth between your chart plotter and your uh, home computer or uh, back and forth from the chart plotter to the home computer. You can also, in some cases, do that wirelessly if your boat has a wireless network system. All right, Mike, thank you. Uh, we have a lot more material to cover. So I think what I'd like to do is, uh, is move on. Why don't we stop here and uh, move on to the section that I'll be presenting where we'll be talking about using OpenCPN with the Marine Navigation course. In order to use OpenCPN to take the Marine Navigation exam, practice crews, and generally answer questions in the course, you need to configure OpenCPN in a way that is consistent with what the instructors and graders expect. To do this, you need to check and possibly change some configuration settings. The first step is to disable the World Magnetic Model, or WMM, plugin. That's done so you can enter a fixed magnetic variation. To do this, Click on the gear icon at the top of the toolbar in the left margin, then click on the Plugins tab and click Disable in the WMM plugin, then click Apply. Next, click on the Display tab and select Units. Verify that Distance is in Nautical Miles, Speed is Knots, Depth is Feet, Latitude and longitude are expressed in degrees and decimal minutes. Make sure the box to show magnetic bearing and heading is checked. Finally, set the variation to minus 15 degrees. Then click Apply. There's one more configuration step you need to take. You need to set the display to North Up. To do this, click on the horizontal bars in the lower right toolbar menu. At the top of the pop-up menu, make sure that North Up radio button is checked. Now you're done. Let's talk about creating and placing waypoints in OpenCPN, and we'll use the Bowditch Bay chart to do so. Assuming we are near C1G and Shark River, and want to begin a course from that known position, let's place a waypoint near the green buoy 1 and name it. To do so, 
Right-click near the CAN buoy and select Drop Mark, which will place a triangle with a dot there. Right-click the triangle and select Properties. Change the name to SRC1G and change the symbol. Now let's place a second waypoint. Assume we want to head southeast towards R10 Quick Flashing Red. Let's place and name a waypoint right there. Same procedure. Move your cursor to the desired location of the waypoint. Right mouse click and select Drop Mark. Then right mouse click on the triangle and change its name to BBR10QR, in this case to help us remember it's in the middle of Bowditch Bay, and change the waypoint symbol. Note the position of the waypoint shows up in the properties box. Now we have two waypoints. Now suppose we want to create a route between these two points. To do so, click on the route icon on the left side menu. Your cursor will be replaced with a pencil. Click on the first waypoint, SRCG1. The dialog box will appear asking whether you want to use the near waypoint in the route. Yes, we do. Now drag the pencil to BBR10QR and click there, and accept that waypoint as part of the route. Let's end the route there with just two waypoints. Right mouse click on BBR10QR and select End Route. If you right click on the route, it will change to orange and bring up its properties box. Let's name the route Our First Route. The route properties box contains a lot of useful information, as you can see here. The Marine Navigation Practice Crews and Final Exam will require that you print and submit route properties to check your work. Let's add another leg to our first route, which is currently made up of two points and is 3.6 nautical miles long. How do we know how long the route is? There are several ways. We can hover our mouse over the leg, and the leg and route summary will pop up. We can use the measure tool by right-clicking on the screen and selecting measure. Click on the first point and move the tool to the second point and read the values. We can also look at the root properties box for the root. Now suppose we want to add another leg to the end of the root, a leg that is 4.4 miles from BBR10QR at 120 degrees magnetic. Right click on BBR10QR and select root from the drop down box. Then select append waypoint from the next drop-down box. Draw a line that is 4.4 miles long and 120 degrees magnetic. Then right-click and select End Route. You've now added a third waypoint to the route. Assuming you have sailed to your third waypoint, and you take a bearing on buoy R8IQR, which reads 20 degrees magnetic. Is that believable? Let's plot the reciprocal from the buoy which is 200 degrees magnetic, and see where it intersects our route. The best way to create a persistent bearing plot is to create a route between the two points. Last time we clicked on the route icon on the toolbar. Like most things computer, there is more than one way to create a route. This time, let's right click on the screen and select Create Route. Click on the buoy, then draw a line 200 degrees magnetic past our course line and end the route. Now zoom in and measure the distance from the waypoint to the bearing line. At about 65 meters, I'd say we were pretty close. If we continue this 120 degree magnetic course, for 7.6 nautical miles more, where would we expect to be? Let's create a third leg and see. Well, it looks like we're pretty close to the mouth of Perkins Cove. The entrance to Perkins Cove is narrow. 
Let's reposition the last waypoint so it's centered between GC1 and RN2. This is done by right-clicking on the waypoint and selecting Properties. Once the Properties box is visible, the waypoint is live and you can click and drag it to another location. How about inserting a waypoint between two existing waypoints on a route? Right-click the leg in which you wish to add a waypoint. Select Insert Waypoint. Then right-click on the new waypoint. When its property box shows up, you can click and drag the point to the desired location. The point automatically shows up in the route's property box. Suppose you want to see the latitude and longitude from your boat to an object and get a bearing and distance to the object. Well, first you need a boat. Without a GPS connected, you have to manually move your boat. Right-click near the waypoint at the entrance to Perkins Cove and select Move Boat here. And the boat shows up. Let's say the object of interest is the abandoned lighthouse tower on the west side of the cove. Hover the mouse over the abandoned lighthouse tower. In the gray bar at the bottom of OpenCPN, you can see its latitude and longitude, and the distance and bearing. In this section of our OpenCPN workshop, we have covered many of the practical skills you need for using OpenCPN on our courses. How to configure OpenCPN for classes, creating waypoints and routes, modifying waypoints and routes, creating a bearing plot, and locating relative and absolute position of objects. We hope you have enjoyed this session. Let's take questions. Thank you, Andy. That was a very good explanation of, of doing something with, uh, with OpenCPN and Marine Navigation. All right, we have some questions um, to get things started. Um, Andy, um, is there a recommended setup for OpenCPM to use for pilot and marine navigation courses? Uh, there is, and what I went through in this video was in fact the setup as I understand it, but of course the marine navigation course has not been released and they may, they may change things, but the instructions will be with the course. They'll tell you how to set it up and they'll tell you the configuration that you need in order to solve the problems uh, for the course, so it'll come with the course. Yeah, I have a question from Kevin Lyons. He says, will these lessons be available on YouTube, on the YouTube channel? Uh, this particular video will. Uh, in fact, this entire session will be available on America's Voting Channel. All right. Um, and let's see, I don't have another question yet. Um, all right, let's see. All right, let's see. Um, how can I become proficient at using with Su oh, how can I become proficient with OpenCPN? You know, the best way is just to use it. You can't break it, and the more you play with it, the more you experiment, the more fun it will be. I've been using OpenCPN since version 3, and version 3 is very different from version 4. Version 4 is, uh, is different from version 5, and each time I've just kind of fired it up and played with it, and if you go through the exercises similar to the ones that we've done here, if you have a problem to solve, then it's a lot easier, but the trick is just to play with it. Yes, and I, and I think to add to that, if you really manage to mess it up really bad, it's so easy to reinstall that I just, I've many times I've just dumped it and redid it. You know, it's funny, Mike, when we did these videos, I think I had OpenCPN open on my computer for about 20 days and it never crashed. It was really stable and I was very, very pleased by that because that was not the case in version four. No, I, I agree with you totally. All right, and um, let's see. Here's another question. Um, the person has played with OpenCPN and found that sometimes I can click and drag a waypoint to a new location and sometimes I can't. What's happening? You know, that was the thing we talked about, I think, in your, in your last video, which is you want to lock the waypoints. So basically, if you go into the configuration dialog box, and you lock the waypoints, and that way you can't inadvertently drag them. And that's really important because, you know, between my fingers and my mouse and moving around and stuff like that, I, I put waypoints in other, in other states.
<laughs> so it's, it's, it's really helpful to just lock them and make sure you don't move them by mistake. I've done that also. <laughs> 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 so, at any rate, all right, I don't see any more questions, so uh, um, thank you very much, and, um, and for those joining late, let me reintroduce myself. This is Mike Mazinski, and for this lesson, we are going to be discussing connecting GPSs to OpenCPN uh, to a PC, uh, and the reason for this, obviously, is to have the GPSs or other things like AAS provide data to OpenCPN so that you can see information on your chart as to your location. All right, now we're going to talk about how you actually start the setup of a GPS device uh, for your Windows laptop so that it will receive those signals. There are a couple things that you have to be careful of, and there are setups in two sep well, several se places. Uh, first off, you have to set your PC up. Uh, in order to share its location, and you need to know where to look up port data. And if you're using a Bluetooth, you need to know where Bluetooth radios are set. So we're going to spend a couple of moments looking at the PC and its controls and seeing where we actually make those settings. All right, you should be seeing my computer screen now. And let's talk about some things that we need to share. Uh, we need to do with our PCs in order to be able to receive GPS data. First thing you need to worry about is down here in the right hand, left hand corner, the Microsoft symbol, we need to be able to find a couple things that are important to do. The first thing you want to deal with is settings and you'll go to the settings menu and then you're going to go toward to the privacy setting. Now, this is at, usually at the bottom here, and it says privacy, location, cameras, and microphone. You need to turn, click on this setting, and what you're going to do is scroll down the left-hand menu to where it says location. And you need to make sure that it says location for this device is on. If that is not on, you need to hit the change button and turn that on. What that does is it allows your device to take any GPS data it receives and pass that along to whatever whatever application or program wants to use it. Uh, if you tell it not to do that, it will not do that. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that page also, if you have a lot of apps on your device that will use GPS data, uh, you can tell them which ones that can. Like for example, you might want to have um, a GPS app share that data uh, if you want your camera to record where you take a picture, you can have it share it. Uh, the weather program's on there. If you share that data, it'll always give you your local weather. So there's a lot of things you can do there. But the big thing is you've got to have the location uh, services turned on. All right, and once you've got that done, we can exit out of this window for the global SAT uh, device. Uh, one that we're going to come back to in a little bit is called uh, devices and it's for setting up Bluetooth and when we need to uh, use this is when we're going to be using a Bluetooth radio. Uh, we need to tell it that there's a radio out there and we need to do a, a thing called pairing. All right the next part you need to be able to do is back down at this uh, start menu again is you need to scroll down the list of your applications and scroll down to the W's and you want to go to the one that says Windows System. When I open that up you're going to see something in there called Control Panel. We open up the Control Panel and there's many ways to look at this. There's a little thing up here that lets me look at it by category, by large icon. I prefer the large icon because I'm blind and I can't see most of the stuff, so I look for it. And the thing I want to look for is a thing called Device Manager. When I open that up, you're going to see a list of all the things that are in your computer that are considered devices. Now, I want to caution here. These can be actual hardware or they can actually be a piece of the software. All right, so there are things that are going to be set up. If you have set up anything that uses a port, you're going to have a item in here called ports, COM and LPT, which used to stand for printers. If I click on the triangle beside it, it'll open up and let me see what's in there. All right, and when we go to set up something, uh, we will get uh, 
a listing of all the ports that are available or uh, in use. Right now, there's uh, a standard serial over Bluetooth linked to COM5. And so we will talk more about that later on. So these can be added if we no longer have that device connected. I can also uninstall this device and it'll go away. And if you come back, you'll notice that now there are no ports configured in this device at this moment. So this is a very, those two screens are very important. When you're done knowing where they're at, close them. Uh, but you do not have to delete anything that you have already pre-configured in your serial port. Uh, that's how you set Windows up. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to configure and plug in the GlobalSat device. A couple little notes. If you, when you go out to buy this, this is really nice thing about this thing. It's under $30. All right, so if you buy one, it's going to come with a little CD. Uh, if you have a device that has a CD player in it, obviously you can play that. If you don't, you go out to globalsat.com, download it on your computer, and install it first. What that does is it installs the serial driver for this device. The next thing we do is plug it into a USB port on a computer. The minute we do that, you should have heard that little tone. That lets you know that your computer has found that device and has basically installed the software for it. Now let's look at uh, the control panel again. I'm going to go back to my Windows menu. I'm going to go to Windows system, go to control panels and device manager. Now when I open up this right now, I'm going to go to my COM ports. Now a new COM device has showed up. I have something here called Prolific USB to Serial COM port number three. Now, one of the things I want to do with this is check how that port is configured. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on it with my left mouse button. It'll turn blue. Then I right click and I go to properties. In properties, I want to go to where it says port settings. And this is something that's been left over from what we call the RS-232 standard. And we have to set uh, the bits per second, uh, the data bit, parity, stop bit, and flow control. There's only one number there that basically we want to check on because uh, everything else is kind of going to be default. And that is the speed of this device and how fast it wants to talk. Right now, it is set to a default of 4,800. Uh, and that's also a term that's also referred to as BOD. All right, so 4800 is actually what we want to set this at. This device will run faster, however, um, but 4800 is the standard that we do want to use at this moment. So once I confirm that it is 4800, I say OK, and then I can close all the windows that I have open, and I am ready to work with OpenCPN. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to launch OpenCPN. I'm going to take a moment, since there's no GPS being seen right now, and I'm going to move my boat to another place. So right now I put it back out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. All right, we are in OpenCPN. we in the control panels, and we're going to go to connections. And right now in the connection screen, it's totally empty because there's no GPS is configured. But what we want to do now is add our GPS. So I'm going to say add a connection. And at this point, I get a choice whether I'm going to do a serial connection or a network connection. Obviously, if it's plugged into a USB port, it's serial. So we've pre-configured the port already. And remember, it, it used COM3, which is uh, the prolific USB. And we had set the baud rate to 4800. Now, as I said earlier, there's multiple speed settings you can use. 4800 is the setting, all right, for uh, standard uh, NEMA 0183 devices. And as you can see here, it defaults to that. Uh, there's no other settings we need to make. It should all be default. And you will see that all these items are here. Uh, this global set takes basically the defaults. The minute I set the COM port and the baud rate, I click apply. Part of the screen, the GPS control 
it's going to turn green and then it's going to get bars signaling how much reception you're getting. All right, and I applied it and it immediately went to green and showed bars. All right, so that in indicates that you now have GPS information being given to OpenCPN program. Also, if you remember, I had the boat out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. It is now moved onto Kent Island, which is where I'm sitting right now uh, doing this presentation. So a bunch of things happen that let you know that OpenCPN is definitely getting GPS information. And one last thing you can do if you really want to is that on the connection screen, there was this thing called NEMA debug window. And what that does is let you see the information that's coming from the GPS. If that screen is blank, uh, there's no data being set. Or if the information is coming and it doesn't look like a data stream, like for example, if it's not showing the, the COM port and it's not giving you uh, codes for uh, GPS data. But at any rate, uh, you get the green screens and once you close that control panel, again, OpenCPN has taken over and it is now getting GPS data and it'll show your ship wherever you are. Plain and simple, the easiest way with the global sat USB GPS, it's probably the easiest one to use. I haven't had anybody yet report trouble trying to use the global sat um, USB GPS. It's very straightforward. It configures quickly and it's very accurate. We're going to talk a little bit right now about configuring a Bluetooth GPS with OpenCPN. Uh, this is a, a global uh, SAT again um, model BT821. They're out there also. They cost a little bit more than uh, the hockey puck USB one does. Um, but uh, again, they're available. Uh, the only advantage of these is if I have a uh, computer that's inside a cabin and I want to put the GPS outside the cabin, uh, this will transmit up to 300 feet uh, to the computer that it's paired with. All right, so it um, gives you uh, the ability to be cordless between the GPS and the actual uh, computer that needs it. To set it up, it's rather straightforward. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be uh, dealing with the computer. The first thing that has to happen is we're going to do what they call a Bluetooth pairing. And the minute we get a Bluetooth pairing occurred, we will then um, deal with setting the baud rate again on the port. And then we will configure OpenCPN to use that port. So that is basically the process. All right, pairing the computer. All right, the first thing you need to do is you're going to go back to the Windows Start menu. That's that icon in the lower left-hand corner. And we're going to go back to the settings controls. And in this case, we're now going to use one called Devices. All right. And this is a Bluetooth GPS. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a Bluetooth or other device. And you also want to make sure that Bluetooth is actually on. All right, so it'll, it'll be on. And what we're going to add is a Bluetooth mouse, keyboard, or other audio device. And before you click that button, the first thing you want to do is on your GPS, push the power button. So it is now powered up and requesting a pairing. So when I click on that Bluetooth thing, your computer is going to start scanning around, looking for devices that are transmitting on a Bluetooth signal. And... It'll try to identify them and ask you if you want it. Well, right now it's just going to display it. And if there's my GPS, so what I'm going to do is click on it and it's going to try to connect. And most GPSs or most Bluetooth devices ask you for a password or display a code that you want to enter. In this case, this device has a password of 0000. zero, 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 uh, zero. All right, so we've got to get four zeros in there, and I say connect. And you find that password either in the manual, uh, which is where you find it actually, but uh, sometimes it'll be displayed on the device. Like if I use my phone, it'll display a code. All right, and it says right now it's paired. So if I say done, all right, now I have, if I scroll down, 
my list of devices, you will see that there's a GPS sitting here and it's paired. So I now have this GPS connected physically to my computer. All right, the next thing I need to do is remember the control panels. I go to the start menus again, scroll down this time to the Windows system, and I bring up the control panels again. And again, I want device manager. All right, and that's going to bring up my list of things. And I want to again go to ports, and it's got three ports listed here, all grabbing three devices, COM5, COM6, COM7. You can actually use any one of them. Let's make sure they're all configured properly and we'll go about using them. First off, I wanna do is look at properties for each one. And I wanna look at the port settings. And this device actually runs higher at 9600 baud, but 4800 is the standard. So I'm gonna change it to 48 and then say, okay. I'm gonna do the same on all three of those just to make sure that they're all set it. So I can use either one if I want. Uh, the one thing that I need you to know, if I decided to set that at 9600, which is actually the recommended speed for this device, uh, I could, it's just a matter that I need to make sure that all the devices that are using this device are set to the same baud rate. All right, so I just set them all uh, to 4800 and remember when we had our sealed device plugged in it was using three so if I were to plug the um, USB uh, port in it would utilize COM3 so I've got the port set I've got the Bluetooth is paired and so now I'm ready to deal with configuration in OpenCPN so I'm going to open up OpenCPN And just for the screaming meaning of it, I'm going to take a moment, since there's no GPS being seen right now, and I'm going to move my boat to another place. So right now I put it back out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. All right, so let's watch what happens as we configure it to use the Bluetooth GPS. I again go to settings. I again go to connections. And I'm not going to remove the old one. I'm just going to leave it there. And I'm going to uncheck it means it's not being used. All right, when configuring OpenCPN with the Bluetooth device, there's a little more uh, things that could happen. First off, if you remember in the device manager, it showed that my Bluetooth GPS had grabbed three serial ports, five, six, and seven. We configured them all to be 4800 baud. Uh, the reason it grabs multiple ports is because this particular device has the ability to talk and listen. So it needs a port for each of those processes. So it has the ability to, to grab more than one channel for different purposes. So the one thing we need to figure out is which channel it is talking on. All right, so I want to talk about that as we configure this device. The one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show the NEMA window and that will let me know if my GPS and OpenCPN are talking to each other. All right, so we're going to add a connection. All right, it's just like we did before. I'm going to add a connection and it's still a serial connection. Although when I look up here, I got three different choices to go on. I'm going to start first with COM5 at 4800 baud, and I'm going to say apply. I am not seeing any NEMA data. So that means there's still something not right. I haven't picked the right channel. So I'm clicking on my uh, connection again, but this time I'm going to go and change the port to six and I'm going to say apply. All right, and I'm going to wait for a few seconds to see if data starts coming through. And we got one more choice. So since this is not showing data, again, I'm going to click on it once and I'm going to change the port to seven and I'm going to say apply. And we're going to wait a few seconds again. Oh, and now you'll see data is starting to come. So it, 
uh, this particular device grab port 7 to talk on. So now I have the device configured. It's talking and I can say OK and close this window and I'm, I'm looks like I'm getting good data out the GPS and it's showing green bars and my boat moved to Kent Island. So we successfully configured an open CPN to use the Bluetooth GPS. So that's how that works. Let's talk about sharing GPS data from your phone. Phones are a very exciting way to share the GPS information with OpenCPN. It's a rather relatively new thing. Uh, there are apps now for both um, Android devices and for iPhone devices. And um, they will let these phones behave as GPSs, uh, Bluetooth GPSs, or in the case of Apple, uh, TCIP um, device to send that data streaming to a um, PC. So um, this is a very exciting thing because most everybody carries a GPS, um, I mean a, a phone, and it's a GPS. Now, GPSs on phones are a little bit different in that they um, utilize the cellular network also. So what this means is that uh, on a regular GPS, if you just turned it on after being off for a long time, or you've moved the location to a distance, it can take five, six, sometimes even 15 minutes to find the satellites in the sky. Now, your cell phone, however, uses this cell phone data. So if there's a cell tower within sight of the phone, if it's seeing a tower, it knows the location of that tower. And so what happens is it, the phones use something called global or GPS system software, which enables the GPS to get its initial location data from a cell phone tower. And then now it knows where all the satellites are and doesn't have to search for them. It just starts looking where the satellite should be and it, it acquires GPS signal a lot faster. Now, if you're out in the middle of the ocean with no cell, fa so ta cell t reception, it will take on a phone a good maybe two to five minutes to find GPS satellites, just like a regular GPS. So that is um, one of the things about having a phone act as your GPS. Now, there are two pieces of software out there that are rather interesting. The slide that you see uh, is showing an application called Bluetooth GPS Output. It's made by Meowbox, Meow's Box. And um, it's for Android devices and it costs 99 cents. So it's a really good bargain for having a uh, GPS that goes to your uh, laptop. There's another application there called GPS 2 IP, which is for iPhones. And um, it is $1.99. So even though it costs more, it's, it's still a bargain at that price. Both of these devices will transmit their GPS location so that a laptop or another device can get it. And the other interesting thing is that the, tele the phone versions of these will usually allow more than one device to connect to it. Uh, so for example, this one right here, Bluetooth GPS output, has the ability to let your phone, uh, let your phone actually talk to five other devices. So it's rather exciting, I think, as far as a way to, to hook up phones. Now, let's look at a phone and see what exactly uh, it is to set one up. Now, like everything else, there are rules for setting up the GPS. Now you are seeing my phone's screen, all right? And as you can see in the lower corner down here is the Bluetooth GPS output. Before I start though, what I need to do is make sure I have what's called loca location data and I have Bluetooth turned on. If those two aren't turned on, then this will not work. All right, so uh, we can close this up and everything's on. The important thing about this application is that it needs to be started first. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the Bluetooth GPS application. And the really Nice thing about this piece of software, you see that wizard's hat at the bottom? That is literally what it is. It's a wizard for 
turning on this software and getting it configured. So at this point now, you actually just run the wizard first. At, it's going to ask you what device we have. We have a Windows computer. And I'm going to win Windows 10. There is a YouTube video out there which you can see and uh, it goes over this whole configuration again. Or you just continue with the wizard. It's going to create two Bluetooth connections. One uh, called SPP slave and one called master. You want it to be the slave because that's where the talking is going on. All right. And there's a button there that you just press and it's going to begin the process of sharing this uh, uh, pairing with my device. All right, we are now looking at my PC again, and I've pressed on the button in the software that shares, says pair to computers. So at this point now, from my computer, I go to settings, I go to devices, and I go to Bluetooth devices. And I go add, and I say Bluetooth, and it's going to look around. The minute you see your device, and you click on the device itself, it'll display a code, and on your phone, it's going to replay the same thing. If they're the same, click on the phone, click pair, and on the computer, click connect. At this moment, the software will do the Bluetooth pairing and make the device able to talk to each other. So now, all right, so I now have a device in my manager called my phone, and that device is now paired with my computer. All right, so at this moment now, I can close this. And remember, our next step is to go to the Windows system and go to the control panels. Go to Device Manager. Look at the ports. And again, it has grabbed 5, 6, and 7 as Bluetooth serial devices. So let's look and make sure that the uh, properties are correct and that they're looking at 4,000 baud. And we can verify that that is set up. And it looks good. All right. At this moment now, I can close that. And I can, if I want to, I can try looking at my uh, GPS information and see if it's going to uh, see uh, GPS information. If I pick COM6, I'm seeing GPS information. So that means my phone now is sending information to this device and as you can see it's sending it out over com6 and this data stream looks a little different because um, not only does this device have a gps in it it has an altimeter it has a, a positioning type uh, sensor in it so uh, that data gets sent along uh, most of it open cpn is going to ignore but it's there so we can see the satellites that the phone now is seeing and the strength of that signal. So let's open up OpenCPN. I close that uh, link and now I'm going to open up my OpenCPN software and I want to move my boat just to show that it, it does see it. So I'm going to move my boat in the middle of the bay again and this time we go back to connect the tool settings, go back to the connection screen. And this was the, the data that was coming out with uh, Ju the Global Sat satellite. But now I'm using my phone, so I need to add another connection. But I'm going to disable this one right now just for the moment. I'm going to add a connection. Again, it's serial. And if you remember correctly, it was talking out over COM6. So I set it to COM6 and I'm going to say apply. Now, if, if everything is right, I should see my 
software immediately see that GPS and it did. It immediately set the bars on the GPS. If I come up here and show the NEMA window, again, it's showing data is coming through and I can now just uh, say okay. And the neat, interesting thing here, why, why I got you here also, is notice that I have multiple devices, depending on what I have plugged in, I can energize it or not energize it. I say apply and okay. And I can close my NEMA window now that I'm knowing getting data. And again, as it said, the GPS shows that I got signal and my ship got moved from the middle of the bay back to Kent Island where we are. So again, here's another way of using your phone to send its data to your um, computer and act as a uh, portable GPS. So that's rather exciting because that means, uh, again, uh, when I talk about navigation with electronics, redundancy uh, is always a prime factor. Uh, if you rely on just one type of system for navigating, uh, you're going to be out there one day without that system. And so having multiple devices that will provide you with that is your guarantee that you're going to be able to navigate to where you want to go safely and always know where you're at. That's the phone. Just a little note, when you're using the Bluetooth GPS uh, software on your phone, uh, when you decide that you're no longer using the GPS, uh, you need to uh, tell the phone to stop transmitting it. And the way you do that is you go into the software again and in the case of the Bluetooth GPS software, there is actually in, on the main screen a slider that says disconnect. And all you do is put your finger on it and say disabled. And now your phone is not transmitting the data anymore and the GPS is turned off. And of course, quitting the application when you're done is uh, another way another part that you have to do. But you do have to tell the software to stop uh, sending data. If not, it'll continue to send it even when you uh, are not away, not near your computer. So make sure you remember to do that. You just saw uh, us connect various GPSs through your computer so that OpenCPN can utilize that data to provide location data. Other instrumentation like AIS, which is probably the most other most desirable component uh, to get connected to your computer, uh, can be connected also serially. There are AIS receivers and trans receivers out there that will utilize that serial port connection. It works exactly the same as we just did with uh, GPSs. All right. The, another way that these devices are also being connected is through a shipboard network. And what happens here is we use various uh, hardware devices to combine the outputs of things like AISs, uh, anemometers, uh, sonars, and combine these datas into a single stream uh, that can be transmitted through a Wi-Fi network. And OpenCPN is very capable of listening to a network connection and displaying the data that's coming over it. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated than what we've just been through. And the hard part is getting the ship instruments to talk to one another. Uh, once you have it on a Wi-Fi network, then getting OpenCPN to listen to it is not difficult at all. But that involves a lot longer presentation than what we've got time for today. I just want you to know it's there, it's available. And if you're interested, it's something worth doing. Uh, thank you for... Uh, attending this presentation. I hope you got something out of it. I do have longer versions of each of the presentations available. And if you're interested in seeing them, you can send me an email to edofficer at ASPSMD.org and I'll gladly get you a link to them. Uh, your comments and suggestions are welcome. And until the next part of this presentation, this is Mike signing off. Mike, that our viewers would like to uh, have that available as a reference and in fact I'm going to suggest that we put that on 
the America's Voting Channel as a separate uh, video so that people can view that one discreetly. Uh, it was. I, I felt like I was watching a little bit of a, um, of a of a mystery there, wondering whether it was going to be COM five, COM six, or COM seven that was going to actually be the active one. So that was great. Um, I'm sure there's some questions. So uh, once again, unmute yourself if you have a question, and wait to be called on. Uh, Kevin Lyon did type into the chat session. Uh, he wanted to know more about the app to download uh, to his phone to get the GPS signal running on his Android phone. Uh, and also, I'm sure people want to know about the iPhone as well. So can you just mention the names of those two um, phone apps for Kevin? Yes, one's called um, GPS to IP. That's the Apple one. And the other one's by Meowbox, and that's called um, Bluetooth GPS Output by Meowsbox. And it's... Uh, it's listed there. If you just type Bluetooth, Bluetooth GPS in the Play Store, it'll it'll come right up for you. Um, I noticed that Ted's got a question. Ted, did you want to weigh in? Thank you. Uh, I was really pleased to see all the different ways of getting the the GPS information into the computer through the Bluetooth. And while you were doing it, I was trying to set it up actually on my computer, separate computer. And when I go to my device manager, I don't have a port listed under the device manager. So from that point on, uh, is there some way to the, the, the icon for ports should show up in the list for the device it's, manager? Um, if you're not, if you plug your device in and the computer doesn't recognize it right away, that's because you're missing a driver. So. Um, uh, there may be a Bluetooth dri driver for that particular device that you're trying to, your phone or, or whatever it is. Uh, the best place to go is out to the website for that phone, and uh, there'll be drivers that you can download. Okay, thank you. I want to thank Joe also for answering the Comport question. Uh, Joe, you, you get a you get a little star because you were right with your answer. Uh, more questions. So, Mike, um, let's talk about the, the hockey puck uh, GPS receiver. Does that need to be mounted uh, outside your cabin, or can you mount it inside your cabin? It depends on your boat. Um, if you have a boat that's uh, uh, metal framed or aluminum skinned, uh, as you saw from the developer, um, that acts like a uh, shield, so uh, it doesn't let... Uh, with radio waves in or out. So in that case, you would have to have the an antenna outside the boat. But if you're working inside a fiberglass boat, it lets GPS signals through, and you should be able to do it, use it inside without any effort. Okay, thank you. Bob Rayburn, you were unmuted. Um, did you have a question? <clears throat> Just a quick question. The G, um, I'm not familiar with GSHHG that Mike told us to click on first before downloading the charts. Now, what is the purpose of that? What does it do? That is, that is the high-resolution base map. And every okay. now and then they revise it to include more detail. Um, if you download that and put it in your chart file, anytime you update charts, if that's been revised, it'll give you a more highly, uh, better detailed uh, base map. It's not totally necessary, but I like to have that nice looking base map there too. Thank um, you, Mike. I think on version 5.2, they may have decided to eliminate it. I haven't totally explored that yet. Mike, um, what about these old Garmin receivers? Can you connect those as well and use them as GPS? Uh, as GPS? Believe it uh, or not, the answer to that is yes. Uh, most of these older Garmin GPSs have a serial port in the back of them, and they still sell them. If you go out and ask uh, uh, your search engine to, to, for the serial cable for a, a particular Garmin model, you'll find that they're out there, and they go uh, to either to a DB9 connector, uh, which is what the older computers have, or to the USB serial. And um, uh, Garmin has a driver for their old GPS is up there on its site, and you download that driver and then plug your Garmin in, and away it goes. 
um, it, it works just like the, the hockey puck. Great. You, well, the only downside is the battery life is not as long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because when I use iNavix with my iPad, even ah. when, it, even when the, my iPad is plugged in, it still drains the battery. Yeah, all these do use battery. Now, the Bluetooth uh, um, GPS radio that I showed everybody, that has about an eight-hour battery life uh, before it needs to be charged again. So, But That's you can plug good. it in also while it's running. All right, so why don't we stop here? Mike, you got, you got to reserve yourself. you got one more section left. So I guess it's time for you to be reintroduced. Hi, everybody. This is Mike Mazeski, and we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about teaching with OpenCPN. This is a very uh, interesting topic because not only does it involve the actual program itself, but it's going to be talking a, bit, a little bit about teaching and setups and all the things that you need to think about when you wish to approach this topic of teaching with OpenCPN. First off, we need to make a couple of assumptions when we begin to teach this course. If not, we have to plan for instruction prior to this course so that this can occur. First off, you need to make sure that your instructors are comfortable with OpenCPN. So working with them to uh, learn all the techniques and things that you would normally use with OpenCPN is important. And it would be good if they actually used it uh, in their own boating. So uh, having experience with the program is extremely important. OpenCPN should be installed with charts on all your students' machines. So they have should, have should have already been in a course which has had some basic exposure to OpenCPN, like piloting or just basically on their own. And of course, the students should have some knowledge of basic operations of the program. For video lessons, and, and it's also important that your instructors be comfortable with the video tools. For example, there are several things that are kind of important. Uh, let me just show you right now in PowerPoint itself. Right now I'm using PowerPoint for this particular thing, but you'll notice right now that my screen is not totally occupied. There's a reason for that in that if you don't set things up in a specific way, you lose access to all your tools. What I want to show you right now is the background of of PowerPoint. If you look at the slideshow tab, there's something here that says uh, set up slideshow. Normally, PowerPoint uses a present by speaker full screen. And what that does, it's up here, it, it, it uh, makes PowerPoint when you're doing a slideshow just take up the entire screen of your computer. Uh, this is good when you're presenting on a data projector with a screen, but what happens when you're doing video presentations is that when PowerPoint grabs the entire screen, you lose access to your presenting tools. So I would no longer have access to tools that my uh, program gives me, like for example, this highlighting tool. What you need to do is you need to set it to browse by individual window. That lets you tell PowerPoint to do it in a window instead of the whole screen. And you need to set your advanced slides to manually. Once you've done that, then PowerPoint will behave itself and you will actually be able to uh, control uh, the presentation and have access to your tools that you need to do. That's an important thing. You control PowerPoint with your page up and page down arrows. That makes things work a little bit better. If students have two devices available to them, they can conference you on one machine and use OpenCPN on the other. This is easier for them than trying to switch screens back and forth. If you looked at the opening picture of me, you will have noticed that there was a screen that I was using for running the application, and I had a little tablet set beside my computer. What that does as an instructor is let me look and see exactly what the students are seeing. That makes things in life a little easier. Uh, in a classroom, obviously, if you can have everybody bring their laptop or device that they're going to run OpenCPN on, they can work right along with you. Uh, doing this live is very good. I've had uh, very little effort with it. The students seem to have uh, low problems, and uh, especially if you have a large class, get one or two helpers with you so they can be going around and keeping people on task. One of the neat things with OpenCPN is working through cruise planning and sharing. Route making is extremely easy. You can simulate tracking on the screen and we're going to show how that works as we go along here. If you use OpenCPN with some training charts, 
you need to make sure that you disable the World Magnetic Model plugin. This is a uh, application that adjusts the variation depending on where your chart is. So obviously the magnetic model variation for the New England area is different than the training chart of a set for 15 degrees west. That means you have to go turn off that plugin, go into the settings display units uh, of OpenCPN and change that to a minus 15, which is the equivalent of setting it for uh, 15 degrees west. And that works for both Bottage Bay and for uh, the 1210 training chart. You also will want to disable quilting, and I'll talk about that as I show this on the screen. And, and make sure the students know where Bottage Bay is because it is up there and up in New England. If you don't know that, you may be looking in the wrong place. Uh, make sure that when you uh, work with OpenCPM, you discuss things like chart groups, route tool, how to make changes on the route, route management, manager ex exporting and importing routes using tracks can be demoed with the move boat here tool sometimes it takes a little bit of thinking outside the box to illustrate a concept to your students when you're teaching with it other than that it's uh, rather straightforward you can use other tools to find such things as for example one thing you can do when you're planning a trip is say all right i want to go from this marina to that marina and on our charts marinas aren't listed they don't tell you on the chart where things are. Sometimes you will see the symbology for a dock, but you're not quite sure that's the marina. So for example, say you want to find a marina. Well, the waterway guides and marina web pages all usually give their latitude. So if you got an idea where the, where the marina is, but you're not exactly sure where, uh, you can go to your chart, set a waypoint, and then enter the latitude that you find from the web. And once that Waypoint locates itself to the lot and latitude that you've entered for it, it will move to the exact location of the marina. So that's a good way to start connecting things. All right, we are right now in OpenCPN. We're doing a live presentation here. I currently have my boat situated in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, which is where I am. Right now, there is no GPS controlling OpenCPN because up here in the GPS area, you can see that the GPS symbol is red and that uh, north up or course up is not green. There's no indication down here that we have active tracking going on. It is just sitting here in trip planning mode. One of the first things you need to do if, is if you're going to use a real chart, I see nothing wrong with that. So you can you actually use charts for the area where your students are boating. And on any course that I teach here in Maryland, in the Annapolis area, I always use the local charts of Annapolis and uh, it makes it very relevant to the students. Uh, but if we're using training charts, let's take a look and see some things here. First off, I have chart groups established for the areas that I cruise. Right now, we're, I'm gonna switch it to the training group. And as you can see, that makes all my charts for the Chesapeake Bay disappear. If I run out, the only two charts I see visible are our training charts. And a couple things you need to think about when you're going about doing that. One thing that we need to do is we need to turn off quilting because if I scroll it, zoom in, to where Bottage Bay is, say I want to use the Bottage Bay chart, it just kind of appears quickly and rapidly. And I can zoom in and zoom out, and that, that can be very annoying. But if I come down here and I open my control panel and turn off quilting, it's no longer going to try to blend this chart with others. And I can now zoom out and see the entire chart, and I can zoom in without the annoyance of the chart switching. Also, if you want to switch to the other chart and it's not showing, if I bring in the training chart of 1210 and zoom in on it, right now it doesn't come up until I come down here where the chart is and I find which one of these represents that chart. This one's Bottage Bay, this one's the training chart, and I click on it. Now it's appeared and I have all the details that I want to use on this chart so it makes it available so switching charts requires that you click in the area of the chart zoom in and identify which one of these tabs down here to describe the charts is the chart you want turn it on and now i can 
work with this chart and do things. One of the first tools that you probably want to learn how to use is move boat here and right click anywhere on the screen and gives you a chance to move your boat anywhere on the screen. And you can only move it by using the move point here tool. Things that I want to talk about, like for example, uh, route planning and stuff like that is extremely easy with OpenCPN. Suppose I want to have somebody do a route around Bottage Bay. Uh, for example, I say I want to go from the Oyster River and then go to the Shark River for fishing and then I'll end up at Perkins Cove. How would I go about showing people to do that? Well, first off, we need to identify all the tools and one of them is the route tool, which can be turned on here. Another way is to right click on it and say a new route. And then if we're doing our traditional start point, which is here by G5, and I point a route there, I've started my route. Well, I want to fish up in Shark River somewhere up here, and I'm going to end my trip down here in Perkins Cove. And right now I'm going to say end the route. So I created a quick route of where I want to go. Obviously, there is some issues with this route. For example, I can't follow that route line. It's not reasonable because there's no safe water in all the lengths along that line. But changing that course line is a real simple thing. Once you got a basic course outlined, you then start at one end of your course, put your pointer on the route, and I want to say insert a route point, a uh, waypoint rather, and then I just drag that right waypoint to a new location as to where the route is safe. I keep inserting waypoints until I get into safe water. I create a route. And if I want to move this one, say I don't want to go around the south end of uh, Channel Island. I want to go around the north side of Channel Island. So I can uh, say safe waters here. I can insert a waypoint and put that where I want it. Now, when I get around here to Perkins Cove, I want to insert a waypoint so I can uh, adjust it. I'll zoom in my chart and make fine adjustments as I wind my way into Perkins Cove and complete the route. That quickly, we created a route into Perkins Cove. And of course, having your students run that route and make sure that there's safe water everywhere they're at and that they're exactly where they want to go is that quick. We can have them either right click on there and go to properties which brings us to the route managing screen and we can talk about how that works the other, another way to get to this screen is obviously through the route manager tool over here on the control panels if i look at this route properties i can call it anything i want trip fishing and away we go. Once we're looking at this chart, obviously there's a lot of things you can sit and discuss with the students. You can modify speed for each leg. You can talk about all the things we talk about with trip planning. So that's a really good thing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with all this, but there are some things that you can do. Uh, one thing that we try to teach students is what's the difference between a route and a track? When you look at this, this is a route. This is where we plan to go and we will probably follow it because it's been verified that it's safe water. Why would you want to use a track? For example, when you're gunk hauling, if, if I wanted to go into Blackfish Creek and I know it's got shallow spots and I'm out here, uh, one of the things you can do is there's a trout tool. Well, first off, I'm let's go assume my boat's here. I want to move my boat here because one thing that's important to know, have your students know about track is what makes track different than route is track is where the boat actually goes. The boat has to go there in order to create a track. If I turn on my tracking tool now and I sit down and start moving my boat like it would be if a GPS was in control of it and I say I want to be here next and I go move boat here and I'm going to move boat here. Oops, I went off my track. Well, let's say I did. And now I come back here and I go move boat here and I go move boat here. All right, and now I turn off my track tool. So I turn off tracking. Now 
I have, and I'm gonna move my butt out of here just to get it out of the way. Uh, you have now a track that represents exactly where the boat went, all right? And as I say, people, the exciting thing about a track, if I gunk hole into a spot here, like for example, there's really shallow water in here, but if I found a path into there, in there, I do know a safe route that would get me back out. So that's how you would illustrate a track. Those are a couple things to do. You can also do simple things like setting a waypoint, you know, drop a waypoint here, drop mark. And then of course, once you right click on that, you can go to properties and you can do all kinds of things with it. First, you can change what the mark is. I can say mark this as a, don't want to be an active waypoint, but I got a lot of neutral things here like red circles and stuff. So let's, let's do one, make it a red circle. And if I want, I can do things to it. I can put rings, so rings around it. Let's see, show waypoint name. I can do range rings. I can say, give me one ring around it at a one nautical mile distance, and let's make the color of that ring red. And I'm going to go back, give it a basic name, danger. And I say, okay. Now I get a range ring around this rock pile it's labeled danger. So that can be something that another way of using waypoints that we can talk about. And again, I said that earlier in the slides, if you don't know where a marina is, you can always just go someplace where you think the marina is, set a waypoint, and then do the properties and modify the latitude and find exactly where that is. Working with Open CPN is extremely exciting. One of the nice nice things about this that I want to emphasize with people is that once you create these routes and these plans, in modern boats, if they have a network, some MFDs, which is multifunction displays, will allow you to use the Wi-Fi network and just transfer waypoints back and forth. Some people can actually set their boat up so that OpenCPN can control their autopilots. Another thing that can be done is with the manager, I can export these. If I have it on and I got tracks, I got routes, if I export everything, everything right now will be saved. If I want to just do the route, I can either export the selected item or I can export all visible. So everything that's visible, the way you turn things off and on in OpenCPN is just to click on it. If it's got an X to it, it's not visible. So that is an important thing. So if I say export all visible and I save that as fishing trip, it is now saved. And obviously I can put that onto a uh, SIM card or whatever the transfer media is for your chart plotter, move it onto there and then have an active route that I can actually use with my autopilots and all the things that I have. And the inverse is true also. If I have did a track on my chart plotter and I want to move that track into OpenCPN, all the track plotters also let you export that and, and then I can import it into OpenCPN. That makes things really simple and really clean to use. And we talk about doing this a class assignment. How do I know that a student did this? That function I just showed you, exporting a route or a track or a project, lets you do that. They can export their assignment, they can save it, and then they can email it to you. You can open it up in yours and, and verify their, uh, their project. They can be shared with other people. And I always give the example of the fact that if you're a um, raft up coordinator or something like that, and you are planning a trip and you got a bunch of boats leaving from a, uh, a marina or from a landmark, you can say, let's do a route from say, one of the local landmarks to where you're gonna raft up and then save that GPX file and just send it out to all the people who wanna participate. So the last part of the trip, for everybody has a planned route in it. Those are all important things that we can do with OpenCPN and that it uses rather rather natively and it works just the way you want to have it work. So OpenCPN is very powerful. It's a wonderful product for sharing routes and using how things work. So I'm sure you have lots of questions. So right now we're going to break for questions. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. 
I would, that was really interesting. You know, chart groups became really important to me because my boating area, I think 90% of my boating area is where the, the 1210 chart is. And so I, when I first started using OpenCPN, it would bring up the 1210 chart, but it would also bring up the 13218 chart, which is the real chart. And both of them would be there, and I would never know whether it was on the training chart or whether it was on the real chart. And so by dumping the training chart into its own chart group and keeping it off of the, of the you know, regular group made a huge difference for me because I'm right there in the middle of Buzzards Bay. Good presentation. So I'm, let's see if we have more questions. Um, I see Ted, you're on. Hi. You, you showed a route with a number of different waypoints on it, and the speed that was listed was six knots, which I believe is the default. Is there a way, or can you tell us how to change the speed for a portion of the route? There's several places. Well, when you when you create the route in the in the properties in those individual segments, you can change the speed. All right, so in that section is where speed changes can be modified. Also, the default speed can be changed up there at the head of properties. And also, in the controls, when you set the default characteristics for your boat, I think there's a speed check in there, too. Well, this was not always the case. We can confirm that the latest version of OpenCPN for PC and Mac does in fact allow you to change the speed in a route for an individual leg. If your version doesn't, then it's time to upgrade to the latest version of OpenCPN. Okay. This is Captain Farmer with a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, and the other comment about marinas, on the inland waters, on the Corps of Engineers charts, they do show marinas. It looks like a outline of a sailboat with a circle around it, and of course you can click on that and, and get the specifics on the marina. Great, thank you. Okay, so we talked about where you get the 1210 chart and the Bowditch Bay chart. The Bowditch Bay chart, I was correct, corrected on my pronunciation a while ago. And yeah. we've talked about, um, let, let's talk about teaching OpenCPN with a mixture of devices, having PCs and Macs and maybe even Androids all in the same class. One thing that I found that helps with that, if I got a group of Macintosh users, if I can get them, if, if it's a live classroom, if I can get them to sit together, they'll help each other. <laughs> the same goes for Android users. If it's all on the on via a phone, um, sometimes I have to look things up. Like the first time I encountered somebody, I, I used to use Macintoshes exclusively a long time ago. Uh, then I uh, went to the dark side, I think. But at any rate, um, so I had to learn all over again the touch patterns for the Macintosh touchpad uh, use controls. But um, Generally, if I have a problem, I just tell people, uh, if I don't know it, I'll get back to them on the next week or I'll contact them and let them know what the issue is. So it's just a matter of uh, letting people help each other and you help them. <laughs> I did anyway. find that there are similarities between touch pads and the Macintosh keyboard. So yeah. you know, if you're using a touch screen thing, just holding your finger on the screen gives you the same kind of responses that you get when you deal with a Macintosh touch pad. So, John, you're unmuted. Did you have any more anything else to, say, to add? Uh, no, the only thing I was going to make the same comment that Mike just did about using a touch screen. Um, if you've got a small laptop on a boat uh, and you're jostling around in waves or wakes, uh, sometimes it's easier to use a touch screen than it is to try to use a mouse on these laptops. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I did forget to say that if anybody had a question, they could unmute themselves and, and weigh in. So if anybody is left with a question, Charles, you showed up, so you got a question? I have two quick ones. One, uh, is USPS making any donations to uh, OpenCPN 
or has there been any encouragement or should there be some encouragement on having members uh, donate, whether it's $5 or $10 or whatever? That, that yeah. is one question. Would anybody like to answer that now? And I'll go um, to the question. Yeah, Mike, if, if it's okay, how about if I answer that one? Go for it. Um, I've never actually approached uh, the Power Squadrons as an organization, but I have always given money to uh, OpenCPN because I'm just so incredibly impressed. Uh, and after version 3, I didn't give any money with version 3, but when I got to version 4, I was thrilled. And I, and I encourage the people in my classes to give, and it doesn't have to be a lot, but, but I do give, and I would encourage anybody else to give. Yeah, I do the same thing. I encourage my people to donate. Um, and I may have even said it on the extended versions of a couple of these videos that support, support them so it keeps going. You know, Mike, you did, and I edited it out in the interest of time. <laughs> <laughs> these, these guys, these guys are putting in an incredible amount of work on this product, and we need to support them any way we can. Absolutely. Thank you, John. It is truly unbelievable what they've done. Charles, your second Maybe question. Got one more question. Yes, uh, I use a Mac and a PC, uh, and Open CPN I like on the Mac because I have a large screen in front of me. But I have a magic mouse, and that thing just wreaks havoc. And I just wondered if anybody else uses a magic mouse, if they figured out a way to, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a Mac, I, I and the first thing I did was get rid of the magic mouse. <laughs> yeah, I've tried that too. I just haven't been able to find a good one, a Bluetooth one. Uh, well, good. you know, I, you know, I, this is like a nine dollar mouse from Amazon. I mean, it's just, and it's a, it's a USB mouse, and and uh, right. you know, I, I just, I, the magic mouse in my hand just don't work together. Mine either. Well, I've tried that, but uh, maybe the two uh, mice I have uh, just, uh, I don't have the right one yet. That's my two questions. Thank you. Well, Thank you so much. You know, we're we're getting to the end. We're getting to the end here. Um, this has been we, we've done a bunch of really important OP, open CPN. Whoop, Mitch, Mitch, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just had a quickie. Can you go through quickly how to do chart groups? That looks great, but I can't quite figure out how to get that done. If I go into the charts tab and I go to chart groups, if I look down below here. This is a listing of all the chart groups that are currently in this. When I first start out, the only chart group will be all charts. And it will just have a listing of all the charts that are available. Now, this is an important thing because since it includes the training charts, if I never want to have those training charts showing if I don't want them, I can remove that from here. So let's make one. All right, I have the training charts here, and I do want you to know that you can get this very granular. I can select a training chart, or I can do both training charts like I'm about to do. What I'm going to do is come down here in this lower chart and say, I want to add a new group. So I click New Group, and it asks me for a name. I'm going to call it Training. And I say OK. The minute I do that, I get a tab that will say training and there it is and there's nothing inside here in the upper screen I click on the grouping that has the training charts and I say add when I do that that grouping appears down here and I can repeat this process for any group if you see if you want to add something to here I can add different charts or I can delete it so I can make as many groups as I want and when I'm done doing that, I click Apply, and OK, if I right-click, I now have chart groups that say, one that says Training. If I turn that on, you can see I have all my charts are inactive except for the Bottage Bay chart. That should be Bottage Bay. There it is. Now, because I can tell right now it's trying to quilt, so I have quilting turned on, so I'm going to turn it off, but this is how you create a grouping. 
If I want the 1210 chart, I click in the area where the 1210 chart is, click on the chart group that it is, and now the 1210 group is available for me to use. All right, if I want to close these down anywhere on the chart, if I say chart groups, if I want to go down to Maryland North and I click there, now all the charts are available except that training chart is actually inactive. So if I click anywhere and I turn on quilting, now I'm going to get all the charts actually defined and it'll merge them all together depending on where I am in the window and cruising. And because I did not include the training charts in this grouping, they're not in here and will not be displayed. That's how you do chart groups. You should use them for efficiency of the program and uh, obviously for safety. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, you guys were great. This was fun. So we're pretty much at the end. So Mike, the one thing, the one question I have here is um, how can I ensure that my students are ready to use OpenCPN? That's kind of a gimme question. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's one thing that you almost have to do. First off, you have, to, you have to start with them saying, you know, are you using OpenCPN at all? And if any of them comes back and says no, uh, I made these videos just for that purpose other than uh, what we're using them here so I could have students go through it and um, I did one time just put an extra class in front where I could actually uh, give people a, a basic knowledge of OpenCPN so that we all had a start point. Uh, good advice so we, we've now made some videos uh, they'll be av available on America's Boating Channel and practice practice practice. <laughs> All right, so that's I, the end. I'd like to thank, I hope you've learned a lot. I have, and, and I actually, I've actually heard these a few times though, so I've had more time to learn them. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I'd like to give special thanks to both John Farmer, who's been our silent partner in putting these together, and Mike Mazinski, who's been our noisy partner in putting <laughs> these together for all the work that they've done. It, it's been a lot of work, so, so thank you both. Uh, this is the end of the OpenCPN presentation, but it's also the end of the Ed Department's presentations for this governing board meeting. So before you go anywhere, let's give Bill McManaman a chance as our National Education Officer to say a few words. Thank you, Andy. Hi, everyone. Whether the OpenCPN seminar was your first session or your seventh, or maybe something in between, we want to thank you for your participation and support of the Educational Department's contribution to the first ever virtual national meeting. Like you, we miss the traditions of a face-to-face -face meeting with our many friends and the opportunity to add new acquaintances to the list. But our team faced the challenge head on and restructured our planned briefings, meetings, seminars, and workshops to bring you important and timely information using the latest in virtual technology. We ask you to help us for future considerations. If you like our strengths, let us know. And if you feel that we have any content or delivery challenges, help us to improve. Stephen Covey, the motivational speaker of the 90s and author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, seventh habit is to sharpen the saw. We believe we by helping us to sharpen the saw, we will be better prepared to transition from what was to what the future will demand. I want to thank the many members of our educational department team that had a part in making this virtual conference a reality and remind you that there is a lot more to come. There's a complete list of all the coming presentations on the USPS website. We ask you to attend where you can. Remember, membership is job one, and we'll see you in Ponte Vedra in February. Thank you, everyone.